It's November 8th, 1942. On the front line, it's business as usual. Battles for piles of stone and sewage wells, the activity of assault and reconnaissance groups in factory shops, fire raids by both sides, mine warfare, bombing, losses. Headquarters are working out plans of operations. The mercury is falling lower and lower. A day like a day. The clouds are particularly low today, black and blue. Darkness descends on the land early. In the distance, the facades of light-coloured houses on the outskirts of the city ghostly whiten. No moon, no stars. Only the bright lines of tracer bullets in the east. And farther south, the whole sky and the glow of gun salvos. They follow one after another so often that the muzzle flames merge into one continuous ominous glow. The earth shakes and groans as if it were a living creature, which is continuously bombarded by blow after blow. The horizon flashes white, yellow and red fire. Light and darkness leap from one to another. Suddenly a lunar landscape appears before my eyes in grey, sad tones. A terrain riddled with ditches, gullies and ditches without a single tree or bush. Blackened craters from bombs and shells, parallel traces of tank tracks, signs with laconic abbreviations and dugouts nestled on the slopes of ditches. In this labyrinth operates the Sixth Army. The last forces are almost running out, and yet it is still ready to jump. After all, somehow it is advancing. The tactics of action by small assault groups day after day brings a gain of territory, albeit quite insignificant. A few metres, a corner of the house, a landing, a hole in the basement. And yet, it is an advance. In the ruins of the destroyed Volga city, the usual patterns of driving the troops collapsed lost their meaning of the simple truths that were taught to us in military academies and schools. Decades of indoctrination and universally recognised principles and authorities simply swept away. Often the military doctrines that have been taught to us in classrooms by highly qualified teachers and which have been extracted with much bloodshed are not applicable here. The scale and severity of this battle changed the arithmetic of war, at least for us. The plots occupied by divisions are only a kilometre long. Companies have from 10 to 30 active bayonets. When attacking, for every five metres of front line there is one gun. Ammunition consumption has increased tenfold. The so-called neutral strip in many cases there is no neutral strip at all. Instead, it is a thin brick wall. Sometimes the front line runs even vertically when we, for example, are in the basement and the enemy on the first floor or vice versa. Capturing a small shop is a day's task for an entire division and is tantamount to winning a battle. Yes, the scale here is quite different. In this period of reassessment of values, there are no more constant values. What's true today is discarded tomorrow. And there is no one here who can cover all the diversity of specific situations and take them into account. Generals and general staffers are at a loss. They act on a gut feeling and try to open up America and then give the troops almost impracticable orders. But they have to listen to the opinion of experienced commanders from time to time. More than that, the opinion of even recently promoted officers is important in assessing the situation. But there is still such confusion that the higher headquarters themselves do not know what to do. One witty bailiff of the division headquarters proposed to put up an announcement. It is planned to capture a large industrial city on the Volga. Useful advice should be addressed to the general who has lost his head. Apparently he knew his division commander well. We have already made many attempts to storm. Often came face to face with the enemy. We know what it is. Half an hour of close combat. But close combat, hand to hand fight, day after day, month after month. That's what Stalingrad is. For many weeks, we have been fighting here to seize a few metres separating us from the Volga. What does this pathetic cat's jump mean compared to the spaces we left behind during the offensive? So what's the matter? What happened to our army? But let us not hang our heeds. There have been many such critical moments in our history. Even Frederick the Ikanay, after a number of his brilliant victories, encountered such stubborn resistance which he could not break. But he was able to manoeuvre, 
and in the end, the change on the Russian throne saved him. The great coalition had broken up. On such a collapse of the enemy camp staked and Hindenburg and Ludendorff in the First World War, but in vain. They failed to split the enemy. And how will it be now? Today, November 8th, Hitler must address a speech to his old guard. In these days, when the former strategic, tactical and military technical values have lost their value and they have been replaced by new ones, when the demand for new divisions sounds louder and louder, his pre-announced speech is for many a ray of hope. They expect him to show them the way to ultimate victory. Thoughts return to the past. Until now, Hitler had been in the habit of speaking before every major event. True, his last year's prophecies did not come true. In 1941, he promised us the greatest victory in world history and the complete defeat of the enemy before the onset of winter. While passing the march music, the adjutant reminds me what Hitler said this spring on the occasion of the Memorial Day for Heroes. He stated then, The Bolshevik hordes will be defeated and finally annihilated this summer. We look at each other. Each of us thinks of those soldiers and officers who heeded those words with trust then and now lie in a foreign land. Each of us thinks of the fact that the Russian resistance is growing stronger every day. The summer is long past. The November wind howls over the dugout. The announcer announces the Führer's speech, and here we already hear the voice we have been waiting for. We squirm in impatience. The usual phrases about 14 years of Jewish domination, about 14 years of national disaster, about the mission of National Socialism, about the intrigues of other states that surrounded Germany and were going to attack it, and so on. All this seems too long to us today. But then the word Stalingrad was uttered. Dead silence reigns. I wanted to reach the Volga at one particular point, at one particular city. By chance, this city bears the name of Stalin himself. But that's not the reason I wanted to go there. The city could have been named quite differently. I was going there because it was a very important point. 30 million tonnes of goods were transported through it, of which almost 9 million tonnes of oil. Wheat from the Ukraine and Kuban flowed there for shipment northward. Manganese ore was shipped there. It was a giant transshipment centre. That's what I wanted to take. And, you know, we don't need much, we took it. Only a few very insignificant points remained unoccupied. Some people ask, why don't you take them quickly? Because I don't want a second Verdun. I'll achieve it with small strike groups. We listen, but not another word about us. God damn it, that's it? Fiedler, who thinks straight and always speaks his mind openly, bangs his fist on the table. His face is grim. Doesn't want a second Verdun? I think we've already lost a hundred thousand, if not more, here, in two months and the casualties are increasing every day. Our battalion doctor resents it too. What does that mean? I'll accomplish this with small strike groups. Our best soldiers are killed, wounded. I've never had so much work to do as I have here. You can hear the frustration and anger in their words. Any soldier in this ruined city can refute everything just said about our successes. We still haven't reached the Volga and the battles that are being fought here for every house, every floor, cannot be glossed over with such words. And no wonder that here, as well as in many other dugouts, everyone is agitated. In September 39th, he still said that with the whole government would go into the trenches. And I asked myself more than once, how could it be that he had been at the front for four years and had not even reached the rank of non-commissioned officer? Such a head... I understand now. I have to intervene, even though I can't answer their questions. Enough! He can't stand in front of a microphone and tell the world exactly how he wants to succeed. The next few days will probably decide a lot of things. Either we'll get fresh reserves, or we'll withdraw to the Don. Military factories in Stalingrad are destroyed, and this is now the most important thing. Now it's all about equipping a solid line of defence for the winter, and it can only be a line along the Don, phone call. I pick up the phone. The Volga commander is on the phone. Von Schwerin speaking. Good evening. Good evening, Mr General. Is everything clear? About what? 
Did you listen to the Führer's speech? Jawohl, Herr General. Then you must have gotten the hint, right? The plan is clear, and you are the chief executor. I didn't get it. Then report to me tomorrow at 11 Seiwo. We'll discuss everything necessary. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. General. I'm hanging up. What did he want, that man who likes to command from afar? I'm to report to him tomorrow at 11 days. He talked about the plan the Führer hinted at in his speech. We'll participate. Did you hear anything in it? Not a word. The old man has a very keen sense of smell. He wanted the Knight's Cross, that's what. He was made a general too soon and we're left to fend for ourselves. The morning of the next day. The sun hardly breaks through the whitish clouds. My car is rushing along the steppe road along the Tatar rampart, past the division medical station, the traction park of our artillery regiment. The faces of oncoming soldiers are faded, haggard, their eyes faded. The last weeks had not passed for them without a trace. Many of them would not be recognised even by their parents and wives. Back in Germany, they must still be living in the old ways. They think that their sons and husbands, fresh-faced, bright-eyed and confident of victory, are rushing forward. The car stops. I'm at the target. In front of the thatched roofed house is a black, white and red striped box. The sentry takes his rifle on guard, and so dashingly that any lieutenant training recruits would be pleased. And so it should be, for here lives not anyone but a German general brought up in the spirit of the old military traditions. What is done on the front line? What happens to the division? I don't care. The main thing is that the sentry knows his job. I'm going in. I'm met by the adjutant. Please undress. There's a shoe brush over there. Mr. General is picky. I take off my overcoat and follow the adjutant reporting. I salute. My divisional commander rises from a desk piled with maps and letters. His figure is large, reminiscent of Hindenburg. He extends his hand to me favourably, almost fatherly. A semblance of a strictly measured smile appears on a face that speaks of great self-discipline. He points me to a chair and takes his seat. His pants, with their dark red bloody stripes, are stretched to the limit. As an old school officer, he wears tight, tight pants, the kind his ancestor must have worn at the balls of Frederick II. While I light the offered cigarette, a large plane of the city is spread out on the table. The general takes out a monocle on a black silk cord from the right breast pocket of his uniform and puts it in his eye. Then he looks at me again with an appraising gaze and leans back. Well, what's your battalion doing? Fully operational, Mr. General. Support points in front of shop number four and in shop number seven, laying a minefield between the factory building and shop number four, reinforcing positions on the road, demining the area by the railroad embankment, and mining the sewage wells. Yesterday again, four killed and ten wounded, urgently in need of replenishment. There are only ninety men in the trenches on the front line. I take the battalion's force plan out of my clipboard and put it on the table. Keep it. Don't count on replenishment yet. But it's urgent to take us to rest. There's nothing to think about. Mr. General, it's already November. Let me tell you. It's time to think about a solid winter position. I know that as well as you do. Our winter position is clear. It's the Volga line. Then we must take Stalingrad. To do that, we must seize shop number four. With shop number four in our hands, the battle for Stalingrad is over. That's clear to me, Mr. General, but where can we get the strength to crush this stronghold? That's why I called you here. You heard the Führer's speech yesterday, didn't you? Two things were clear in it. The first is the objective, Stalingrad. The second is the method, small assault groups. And who are our specialists in assault operations and close combat? Sappers. Yes, Mr. General, but where will we get fresh engineer battalions? Nobody's talking about fresh forces. You'll do it. With my battalion? Mr. General, that's out of the question. My battalion is too weak. You don't even know how strong you are yet. I'm giving you the Croatian Regiment, the Second Sapper Battalion, all the division's infantry guns and the anti-aircraft battery. In addition, you'll be supported by our entire artillery regiment. 
And yet, Mr. General, it's impossible. My best sappers are dead or badly wounded, the very ones who could advance and know the terrain. In addition, I would like to draw your attention to the following. I know the terrain perhaps better than anyone else, and I too have outlined a plan. I cannot understand why we stick to the Ludendorffian strategy of ramming and breaking front orly to smash our heads against the wall. It's better to use a bypass manoeuvre that can be executed by neighbouring divisions. Yes, I must tell him that. Then, on the Don, I had my fears too, but in the end I let him convince me. For that, Rath's whole platoon blew up, and what he's proposing today is even more nonsense. I don't need your advice, and I will not be lectured. You'll understand the other language better. Division Orders, 1011. Attack Workshop. Number four, take it and make your way to the Volga. Understood? Yawol, Mr. General. Be reasonable. Don't make a face like you've heard a death sentence. Mr. General, it's not about me. But as a commander, I'm responsible for the life of every soldier. My battalion is inoperable. It needs replenishment and rest. Von Schwerin ignores it. I know all this, but I can't help you. We must take the city. I, too, resist senseless orders. But in the end, I have no choice but to give my commanders the required orders. An order is an order. I don't believe him. Outwardly, he is a man of character, but in communication with his superiors completely lacks his own opinion. However, whatever it is, and I must step on the shop number four. We negotiate the most necessary things. With great difficulty, I achieve a delay in the offensive for one day. I need these 24 hours to establish communication, training, reconnaissance, and bring the battalion to combat readiness. I get assurances of maximum possible support. Maybe we'll succeed after all. I begin to look at things a little more confidently and say goodbye. I pass by the sentry again, taking on guard, and go to the car. I decided not to show the battalion a shadow of doubt. I must give the impression of complete confidence. If the operation succeeds, my concerns will not be of interest to anyone anyway. And if it doesn't, toward the end of the day, the unit commanders I've summoned show up, the figurists they tell me are sobering, the 2nd Engineer Battalion has only 30 men. The number of serviceable infantry guns is 8. The anti-aircraft battery has only 6 20mm guns. And that's it. I order the commanders I need to appear the next day at 4 o'clock at a certain point, from which we will all together examine the territory of the factory. Once again, I estimate my forces. Terrifyingly weak fighting order, which tomorrow will go to attack the fortified position. My last hope is the Croatian regiment. I put on my cap and belt and go to the command post of the Croatian regiment. Colonel Pavaric is sitting with his adjutant at the table. The bailiff is just setting up for dinner. The colonel stands up and gives me a friendly greeting in German with almost no accent. Please sit down. We received a package today. Would you like a Croatian cigarette? I sit down comfortably and begin to express my requests. The regiment is already in the loop. I find out that apart from the artillery division, there is only one battalion left of the whole legion, which numbered 5,000 men. It consists of 300 men. It occupies a position near the northern part of the territory of the factory. It's commanded by Major Bravikov. Contact him and give him your orders. I agree with everything in advance, says the regiment commander. Just leave me alone. I've had enough. I'd like to be in my Croatia now. That's what I'd like most of all. Anyway, there is no worthy task for me at the front at the moment. You see, and he shows me a volume of Nietzsche. I've taken up philosophy. And besides, I'm busy with awarding things now. Here, look, our orders are beautiful, aren't they? The colonel puts the pictures of orders in front of me and with increasing enthusiasm begins to spread about his crosses and medals. I try to escape from this uncontrollable flow of words, still remaining within the limits of politeness. I succeed, and finally I stomp back to my room. I resent this colonel, his irresponsible behaviour, his indifference to his soldiers, 
his child's play. And such a man is the commander of an entire Croatian legion. I am beginning to doubt the principles of the so-called natural selection of the best. But, so it happens all these three years, the harsh reality of the war interrupts the course of my thoughts, does not let me think to the end. Damn it, only three hundred men, one single battalion and nothing else. That's all I can count on. And who knows what state my units are in now. In the evening I sit with the commander of the third company for a long time. In front of us the plan of the city, we discuss all the options. Feidler is extremely pessimistic. No, it's no good. Don't rely on others. You can only count on our men. And think about what reserves the enemy has. Every dead Russian is replaced by two others. No argument there. That's why I opposed this offensive. It didn't work, and now we have to attack no matter what. And if we do attack, it's to keep the place quiet. But now I must convince Fiedler that we can succeed. That's right, Paul. The Aero 815 method won't do anything here. We must find new ways. That's what you're saying. I think we've had enough of this method of warfare. What has it gotten us to? In the front line, a thin chain of fire. Every soldier is a pearl on a string. And behind, where we used to have reserves, there's a void. Shit, that's what it's called. You're right, Paul. But what's that got to do with us? I'm going to take shop four with explosive charges. I'm explaining my plan to him. I'll throw four strong strike teams of 30, 40 men each. Each is divided into an assault group and a guard group. I'm sketching a scheme, outlining the points of the offensive order. Artillery preparation by artillery regiment and guns. Direct support infantry should last only a few minutes, so as not to completely deprive us of the moment of surprise. Do not break into the shop through the gates or windows. We must blow up a whole corner of the shop. The first assault team will enter through the gap. Next to the assault team leaders are the forward artillery observers. Armament of assault groups, assault rifles, flamethrowers, hand grenades, concentrated charges and explosive bombs, smoke candles. The combat guard group has machine guns, automatic rifles, explosive charges and mines. The distance between both groups is 30 metres. The repulsed territory is immediately occupied and secured by Croatian units coming row second echelon. Filler listens calmly. I explain on the schemes, I show on the map. Finally, he nods his head and says, If a nut can be cracked at all, it is only this way. I must say that little by little I begin to believe in success. The main thing is the idea of blowing up the corner wall of the shop. It could be a win-win. What have you got in there? An order of attack? Just a rough outline. There's still a lot of changes to be made. Read it anyway. Well, if you want, but I repeat, based on tomorrow's intelligence, a lot of things will have to be changed. You'd better see for yourself. Fiedler reads, Offensive Order 111142, the enemy holds some parts of the territory of the plant Red October, with considerable forces. The main point of resistance is the open hearth shop. Capture of this shop means the fall of Stalingrad. On 11-11, the 179th reinforced Sapper Battalion takes over the shop number four and makes its way to the Volga. The immediate task is the southeastern side of shop number four. The order lists the units involved in the offensive artillery support means, reserve delimitation lines, location of CP and dressing station, set light signals, etc. D. 7. I order the initial position to be taken by 3.0 deploy code name, Martin. Paul undid the buttons of his uniform. That's a good sign. Three o'clock in the morning. Tony hits the brake sharply. Damn it, that was close. The car stops a few centimetres from the shell-shattered motorcycle. The motorcyclist is lying next to it. His helmet is lying two metres away. Fidair and I jump out of the car. At a glance, it's clear. We don't need any help. His overcoat is torn and soaked with blood. We carry the dead man to the roadside, push the mangled motorcycle aside. We must go on. In the greenish cold moonlight, the car sneaks through darkening lowlands, climbs steep slopes, 
bypasses fresh shell craters and rushes on. Ahead of us is the glow. This is Stalingrad. During the day it smoulders and smokes, at night it burns with bright flames. A huge cloud of suffocating cinders hangs continuously over the ruins. Soot is lying all around. This ominous cloud seems to warn every newcomer. Turn back, it's hell here. But our senses have already been dulled over the past weeks. We are already deaf to the voice of blazing fire and destruction. We look at the surroundings as if through some special glasses. What is close by, smoking ruins and dying comrades, becomes blurred loses its clear contours. Only a huge goal in the distance is clearly visible. Exit to the Volga and rest. We look like a toy train. It rushes blindly across the room, in spite of chairs, carpets and legs, until it topples over, having run into an insurmountable obstacle. We pull up to the White Houses. Tony puts the car under the cover of a secure facade where it is not viewed by the Russians. Let him wait for us here. We put on our helmets, take our automatic rifles and move in the direction of Red October. Over our heads machine guns are firing. Sewing machines, says Berger. Suddenly it becomes as bright as day. A yellow torch flashes in the sky, illuminating the scorched terrain. The howl of an approaching mine. Take cover. A burst. One, another, a fifth, an eighth. The fragments are small, but enough to pierce the head. There's that nasty sound again. A few more bursts. The mortar raid is over. It's getting quiet. The flares are out too. I want to get up. That's easy to say. I'm almost buried, but I didn't even notice it. I shovel the ground, shake it off. Paul, Berger, Emig, they're all here. Emig is bleeding. He didn't have time to throw himself on the ground and was thrown by the blast wave. His nose and chin are broken. Ah, it'll heal before vacation. We're moving on without incident. Wait, who's coming? Dunkirk. We're at the Infantry Regiment's CP. Is the Lieutenant Colonel in? Yes, he got back ten minutes ago. I tell the others to wait in the cellar on the left, where the communications centre is, and I go down a few steps myself. Wolf comes up to meet me, chewing on both cheeks. He has a piece of sausage in his left hand and claps me on the shoulder with his right. What a mess we've had. The Russians have broken into shop too. Fucking pig shit. The Russians overslept. I just came from there. Everything's all right now, thank God. He takes out a flat flask from his back pocket and takes a big gulp. Talking about the task at hand, Wolf's greenish face, greenish from sleeplessness, revives. His eyes shine slyly. He hopes that his regiment will be relieved. I ask Wolf to pass to the battalions the data of our intelligence and describe the place where lies his dead motorcyclist. Goodbye. Outside my companions are already waiting for me. The night darkness has changed to dawn twilight. Everything is ghostly. Every square metre of land seems to be ploughed over. As far as the eye can see, there are craters from bombs, shells and miners. Here, a surviving corner of the house, there, the descent into the cellar, and between them, like huge fingers pointing to the sky, stick out stove pipes. Smoking piles of rubble complete the picture, the stench. We hurry to take cover ahead in a narrow gully. Lightly wounded people are stretching towards us. Our path is crossed by soldiers going to mortar positions on the side. They carry shells, mines, boxes of ammunition. Shells burst in front and behind us. On the right, on the left. Every five metres we lie down and hear shrapnel whistling above our heads. During the battles in this city we developed new qualities. We have learned what we did not need in France. To throw ourselves on the ground at the right moment, not a second earlier, not a second later, to see through the stone wall whether there is danger lurking behind it. A newcomer who gets to the front line for the first time here does not even have time to get used to it. The time for training is too short. Before you know it, you are gone. The old men, those who were at Stalingrad from the very beginning, have adapted to this unusual war, which had not been experienced by a German soldier before us. 
And how can you compare the officers of our division, what they were even six months ago? It was, with few exceptions, quite a certain type of officer, created by education and experience. Today, everything is different. The war in a ruined city, the incessant fighting, the colossal losses, all this has changed people. What they have in common now is an aversion to orders that require more sacrifices, but some are calloused enough to give and carry out any orders without hesitation, while others resort to the bottle to dull their conscience for a while. Such officers, after an unsuccessful offensive, are completely lost, and the former, with apparent indifference, register losses and go on to current affairs. Such behaviour, however, is deceptive. Behind the facade of imperturbable calmness, they also hide a slight cramp that squeezes their throat when only half of the whole company comes back. But they want to keep their composure at all costs. No one must notice their inner struggle. They see the staring eyes of the soldiers and say to themselves, do not give in to hopelessness. Among such we see the blind followers of Hitler. For them, any order is wise and good because it is given from above and corresponds to the will of their Führer. They do not burden themselves with thought. But others, and there are more of them every day, begin to think. They see how tank and infantry divisions are thrown forward one after another, and how these divisions soon turn into a heap of metal and slag, into mountains of corpses. They see how the combat effectiveness of the troops is gradually falling. And they ask themselves the question, why this meat grinder? They ask themselves, why are so many people sacrificed here? But they cannot get a reasonable answer to their questions, and therefore they just helplessly spread their hands and only try to save their soldiers, to prolong their lives a little bit. Sometimes it looks like fear, sometimes cowardice, but it is rooted much deeper. They do not let themselves be led by the nose. Among this group of officers, there are those who do not ask such questions. The varnish of many years of education has come off them and they just cowardly, not going as far in their thoughts as others. True, there are few of them, but they cannot be discounted. One way or another, it is no longer necessary to talk about the unity of behaviour of frontline officers. As during these months the whole army has become different, so in its officer corps, from the commander to the last platoon commander, there is now an internal crisis, the outcome of which is impossible to foresee yet. I look at my watch. It is about four o'clock. In front of us is the designated meeting place, a small tower about five metres high. However, it was like that three days ago. Now it's just a pile of broken bricks. All unit commanders have arrived, but we cannot inspect the area from here. The tower is destroyed so we need to get close to the shop. Assign a new assembly area, spread out, move. It's getting uncomfortably light. It seems that the Russian gun crews have already had breakfast. Now and then we have to throw ourselves on the ground. The air is full of ashes. We hardly have time to catch our breath. But we can't lie there indefinitely. Further, further, here there is not a single spot where you can consider yourself out of danger. At the railroad track, I greet the commander of the infantry battalion located here. Throw, and the embankment is behind us. Now only to overcome the asphalted street with broken streetcar cars. Through the dug-up roads and pieces of iron roofing lying on the ground, through the cloud of fire and dust I run on. A few more metres. I've made it. Barely catching my breath. I press myself against the surviving façade, looking back. The others are approaching. They are sneaking across the terrain like frightened field mice. And above it all is the innocent smile of a child looking at me intently from the photo on the ruined wall of the first floor. I involuntarily think of my home, of German towns. What will happen to them? The first bombs have already fallen on them. Will it be the same there as here? The wall under which I lay down is quite thick, about 80 centimetres. All that's left of the stairwell is an iron frame. I pull myself up, waving to the others. Five metres from the ground embrasures, from which opens a good view. We spread out between them and survey the terrain. Just 50 metres away from us is workshop number four, a huge gloomy building. 
In front of it and to the left of it is a picture of total destruction, blackness and rust. Shell craters and piles of coal, piles of steel beams and mangled metal, blistered rails sticking upwards, shell-wrecked and bombed freight cars. Our mine barrier stretches across this maze. I recognise the landmarks by which we once made calculations. Directly below us is a well-camouflaged machine gun with two Croatian soldiers. The others are probably in the dugout. Shop number four is a building over a hundred metres long. The front part is 40 metres wide, the rest is 80 metres. It is the core of the entire factory, with tall chimneys towering above it. The half-open gate of the workshop resembles a sinister moor. Nothing is visible inside. Quietly I explain on the ground the plan of attack, but at times I have to shout so that my voice could be heard among the scraping of metal and the whistling of shrapnel. I'm talking about the six open hearth furnaces standing in the shop. They go deep into the ground. Stairs lead down to the depth, 40, 50 metres down. They end in the concreted rooms where warehouses and canteens used to be. Perhaps from there, there is an underground passage to the Volga River. Probably, in this way, reinforcements, food, ammunition and equipment are delivered to the territory of the plant unnoticed by us. I turn to Field Feeble Fetzer, who is pressed against the wall next to me. Blow up that corner of the shop on the right. Take 150 kilograms of explosives. The platoon should arrive tonight, and in the morning the explosion will be the signal to launch the attack. Can you manage? Yes, Mr. Captain, I'll do it. I'm giving instructions to the others, showing the initial lines of attack. The order to attack remains essentially the same. Then we leave the inhospitable place. Everyone goes to prepare for tomorrow's offensive. For a short time I go to the Croatian Major Brajvikov's CP. When I don't see him, I give my orders to his adjutant. Then I go to my own place. The last Martin arrives, a report on the occupation of initial positions. I look at my watch. 0255. Everything is ready. Strike groups have already taken the initial lines of attack. Their weapons and means of close combat checked. In the mine barriers in front of Shop 4, the passages have been made. Everything is in order. Batteries of infantry guns aimed their barrels at the object of attack. Shells are at the ready. Everything is in order. Anti-aircraft batteries are in firing position, 20 mm guns ready to fire. All is in order. Croatian battalion is ready to move immediately in the second echelon. Telephone communication has been established. Battalion doctor has set up his infirmary. Everything is in order. Relieved, I light a cigarette. It's pretty cold and uncomfortable down here at the Croatian CP. A completely smoky hole with two bunks, a small table and four stools. Lime falls from the ceiling every minute. The light of the kerosene lantern withers. Outside it is comparatively quiet. Only from time to time one hears the nervous rattle of machine guns. Between machine gun bursts, the cellar is shaken by shell bursts and we are covered with a layer of dust. But the cellar seems secure. Its reliability is guaranteed by Major Bravikov himself. The more reliable, the better, is his motto. He can really feel safe here. After all, there's still a dilapidated house above the cellar. Nevertheless, fear is written all over the Major's face and he keeps asking me, how long do you think this will last? I don't know what he means by the word it, and I don't want to know. This is the time to step on it. I stand up, pacing back and forth. Light comes through a small crack. I walk into the light, swing the door open, and find myself in another cellar, a slightly larger one. A fire is burning in the centre. One hundred and fifty soldiers are sitting and lying around it. The impression is bleak. Exhausted faces, tattered uniforms, their knees are coming out of their pants. No one thinks to patch up. There is neither time nor a needle and thread. Since there is no hope for the change of units, the process of decomposition of military discipline, it seems, is going on more and more. The boots are no better. They have fallen apart, the soles are tied with thin wire. But no one cares. Some soldiers, soaked and cold, are sitting so close to the fire that the flames are about to spread to them. 
They stare dumbly at the fire. Others, with their eyes closed, are stretched out on their stomachs with their hands on their heads. The exhausted ones snore, covering their heads with their overcoats. In the corner, two men are whispering about something. The smaller soldier is holding the iron cross with a new ribbon. On the right, in the corner, a paramedic is dressing the wounds with iodine. The atmosphere of complete abandonment and some strange half-sleep. It's time to go out. Berger stays at the machine. Together with Emig, I make my way through the endless ruins in the area of the initial position. It's still quite dark. Only much further south in the sky stretched luminous threads of tracer bullets and shells. I've arrived just in time. From behind come the salvos of our guns. Invisible shells are making their way through. Howling and whistling, they cut through the air and burst 50 metres ahead of us in the shop. Black columns of earth and smoke rise up. The hits are clearly visible as dawn has already broken. The shells again plough through the already cratered terrain in front of us. The bursts follow one after another with incredible speed. Above the shuddering ground there is a rumbling sound that covers everything. It rises and falls, but it does not stop for a second. And suddenly there is a rupture right in front of us. To the left is another one, followed by another. Shop, factory yard and chimneys. Everything disappears in a black fog. Artillery observer to me. God damn it, are they crazy? Underflight. And then my voice breaks. What's that? There, in the east, beyond the Volga, the lightning of gun salvos flashes, one after another. But that's alien artillery. Is that possible? No artillery man in the world can respond so quickly. There's something wrong. On the left, we hear shouts of, Orderlies, over here. That means casualties before the attack even starts. With our forces, that's all we need. But our artillery is already moving the firing shaft further away. Let's go. Field Feeble Fetzer, easily, as if his body has become weightless, jumps out of the ravine and sneaks to the silhouette of the building looming before him in the semi-darkness. Now it was up to him. Will there be enough explosives? Are the fuses set in time? Fetzer returns. He hasn't been gone more than a minute. He's barely out of breath with excitement. His nostrils flared like a rushing horse after a race. It's on fire, he exclaims and falls to the ground. My whole body shakes and I can hear my heart beating. Now, now. A blindingly bright flash. The wall of the workshop slowly collapses, a deafening thunderclap bends everyone to the ground. A powerful blast wave sweeps over us. Shards of stones, bricks, pieces of metal and sheet iron fly. We are enveloped in a thick fog, grey and black. The smoke eats away at our eyes. You can't see a metre ahead. Into this cloud of smoke, overcoming the barriers, rushing assault teams. When the wall of smoke dissipates, I see that the entire right corner of the shop collapsed. Through a ten-metre gap, climbing over the newly formed piles of stone, the first sappers burst into the shop. I can see that to the left in the shop is already breaking through, and the second assault group, that the offensive in the open area is successful. The anti-aircraft battery took the roof under fire with tracer shells. At regular intervals support the attack with their fire-heavy guns, now forward are moving forward groups of combat guards, and yet I suddenly feel a kind of desperate fear. Why, I do not know, perhaps because of the Russian fear attack. Together with Emig, I jump into the gapping hole in front of me and climb up the pile of rubble. At that very moment, 30 metres away from me, the first white flare flashes, signifying, we're here, it must be Fetzer. I look around from the large funnel. There is semi-darkness all around, a sort of ghostly world, like an ancient Gothic cathedral. I can't see much at first. The defender has a decided advantage here against the intruder. Ricocheting bullets hit the ground in front of me. Those are shots from the attic room. Have the anti-aircraft guns move their fire up here. I'm sending a contact. Gradually, my eyes get used to the darkness. All around, as if swept away by a powerful hurricane, in a wild chaos, pieces of metal carried. 
Mangled metal slabs hang from the ceiling. Stanchions and beams stick out of the ground. But worst of all, inside the shop is one continuous crater. The aviation bombed this factory for weeks. Squadrons of bombers, dive bombers and regular bombers alternated between them. Howitzers, cannons and mortars turned the place upside down. There wasn't a whole place left standing. Above the black craters, along and across the beams and bars. A soldier who is ordered to advance here must keep his eyes on his feet at all times, or he will get tangled up in this chaos of metal and hang between heaven and earth like a fish on a hook. Deep craters and obstacles force the soldiers to move in a crawl, taking turns balancing on the same beam. And the Russian machine gunners have already shot these points. Here concentrates the fire of their machine gunners from the attic and from the cellars. Behind each ledge of the wall, the invading soldiers are waiting for a Red Army soldier and throw grenades with precise calculation. The defence is well prepared. The battle for the shop is just beginning. And how will it end? Fetzer lay down about 50 metres from me. Killer oblique machine gun fire pinned his group to the ground. Our machine gunners are taking fire from this firing point. They fire their magazines with such rapidity as if they wanted to use up all their ammunition at once. The group jerkily moves forward. The echo of bursts rumbles. This is the beat of infantry guns. The rumble of explosive charges is getting stronger. The walls of the shop are collapsing. I jump out of my funnel. Five steps and the fire again forces me to lie down. There's a sergeant next to me. I push him, call out to him. No answer. I tap his helmet. His head hangs to the side, the distorted face of a dead man staring back at me. I lunge forward, trip over another corpse and fall into the crater. Emig pulls me out. Across from me are conical pipes through which snipers are firing. We use flamethrowers against them. For a few moments, it's as bright as daylight within a 30 metre radius. I manage to notice a barricade of cars crossing the shop. Rails, beams and steel bars. Not far away, the assault group is lying in wait. There's a deafening rumble. We're being pelted with hand grenades. The defenders are resisting with all means. Yeah, they're tough guys. I'm crawling forward like a lizard. Feldfeeble Fegzer to me, I shout with all my might. A few seconds later, someone falls on my back and immediately rolls aside. It's Fetzer. He pulls me to him in a flat recess. It's not moving. We can't take the shop. Half the men are already out. Fetzer, do you have enough explosives? Then punch a hole in the barricade. I'm on it. But what good will that do, Mr. Captain? Another 20 metres and I'll be left with two or three soldiers. I'll send a whole company to help me. Then you can take it. All right. I jump back as fast as I can. The defenders are coming at me from all sides. Death is howling all over the place. I make it to the crater in the corner of the shop. There's someone there. It's our doctor. He's bandaging a wounded man. Doctor, why are you here? There's over 40 people already, mostly seriously wounded. But your dressing station is behind us. It's too far from here. A lot of people I couldn't help. All right, how many on yours? Seven, I can't believe it. Three hours of fighting and we've only advanced 70 metres. I'm sending Ermig, first Croatian company to move out immediately. Bring it to Fetzer. I'm slowly getting out. Outside, the sun is bright. The clouds float slowly and majestically to the east. To the north, fighter planes are rushing by, outpacing the hum of their engines, the metallic ringing echoing in the clear air. A few hundred metres away, I see two helmets. These are soldiers of Limbach's assault group. The others are obviously there too, from the embrasures of the shop they are being fired at. Towards me comes Emig, behind him at a distance of a good hundred metres in a scattered formation, followed by a hundred Croatians. With fierce faces they are rushing towards the shop, number four. I turn around. At this very moment a red rocket is just rising above the shop, followed by a green one. It means that the Russians are launching a counter-attack, and need reinforcements. The Croats arrived just in time. The liaison officer praised them yesterday. Without hesitation, they go straight to the target. 
Their strength is in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They'll make Fetzer's position easier. In the basement, Berger rushes towards me. Mr. Captain, Fetzer just reported that the Russians are attacking. I know, the Croatian company is on its way. Another report from the right. Sprenger hasn't advanced a step. I think today is a failure. What a clairvoyant. If you only knew how many casualties we've suffered today. I'm turning around and giving orders. Major Bravikov, one company to immediately take up the defence at workshop number four. Immediately. The phone is buzzing. Yes? Fielfeeble Fetzer is on the phone. The Russians are attacking. I can't hold out any longer. Have the Croats arrived? That's right. But it's no use. Some of them come under fire and die, while others bow to the bullets. The officers can't get their men up. It's up to you on the spot. If you can't hold on, pull back. A Croatian company will be waiting for you at workshop four. Jawohl, it's really impossible to hold on. I'm pulling back. A sapper stands to my right, covered in clay and mud, sweat running down his face. A report from Mr. Schwartz. Oberfeldfebel Limbach is seriously wounded in the head by a shell fragment. Half of the assault group was killed. The rest are lying low, unable to take a step forward or backward. The resistance is too strong. Feldfebel Schwartz asks for reinforcements and further orders. I give the liaison a written order. Lie down until darkness falls, then move back to a defensive position. So, it's over. Everything was useless. I don't understand how the Russians still have strength. It's incomprehensibly. Powerless rage overwhelms me. For the first time in the whole war, I'm faced with a task that simply cannot be solved. If we attack shop number four with small assault groups, there is not enough strength to overcome all the barriers, to break through to the depths and finally crush all the cleverly built defences. If attacked by larger forces, they cannot deploy in the narrow space of the shop and is simply a more convenient target, they are destroyed piecemeal. So, shop number four can't be taken by direct attack, at least not with our forces. The realisation of this fact shocks me. I have never experienced anything like this in all my campaigns. We broke through stable fronts, fortified defence lines, overcame waiter obstacles equipped it with engineering, rivers and canals, took well-equipped pillboxes and pockets of resistance, captured towns and villages. We always had enough ammunition, oil, gasoline, explosives, smoke bombs, steel, pig iron, non-ferrous metals and rubber. And here, just before the Volga, some factory we can't take. It's a sobering blow for me. I saw how weak we are. I ask you to connect me with the general. In the meantime, I received a report from the doctor. 110 wounded have passed through his hands, including 60 only from my battalion and Sprenger's group. That's 50% of all those involved in the attack. Many had such wounds that they could not be taken to the division infirmary. The Croats have 30 men killed. 50 are lying at the dressing station waiting to be evacuated. The doctor himself is at the old place. I'm doing a quick calculation in my mind. The battalion began the offensive with 90 men. About half of them are wounded, 15, 20 people killed. That means no more battalion. They won't give me any reinforcements. They call me to the phone. This is the Volga commander. Von Schwerin. So what is it? Are you really speaking from the Volga? I'm reporting to the general how the offensive went. I say it was impossible to take the shop by frontal attack. I report the losses. The general is angry. In a harsh tone of voice, he declares, It doesn't concern me. The shop must be taken today. Is that clear? Mr. General, that's impossible. There's no such thing as impossible. You're a soldier, and you should know that. Gather the rest of your group and prepare a new attack. It starts in half an hour. Mr. General, see for yourself. I'm in no condition to attack. Do you allow yourself to argue? Mr. General, I repeat, I can't attack. Mr. General, at nightfall, I'll come to you and report to you personally, as well as make new proposals. Mr. General, I think this is the only way. Tomorrow we may not have the strength to do it. Hmm, he's thinking, sketching, writing something down. First of all, my dear, 
I express my gratitude to you and your battalion. Although you did not achieve the goal, but you can attribute to your and account that thwarted the far-reaching offensive plans of the enemy. As for your proposal, I want to think about it some more. Also, must talk to my 1A. We'll probably report this plan to the Corps Commander. Let him give us reserves. And the rest? The General makes a small pause. You must finally understand the requirement of the time. In my opinion, we are on the eve of the final victory. Stalingrad will determine the outcome of the entire war. Therefore, our sacrifices are not in vain. Here in the East, the new Reich is being forged. Here is the living space we need to breathe freely. Then our people will always have work and bread. That's what you should think about before you come to me with your complaints and wishes. And besides, we are liberating the Russian people from the Red Terror. We bring them the benefits of our culture. In a short time, new settlements will grow in place of huts. The country will be cut through by highways. Every peasant will have his own safe razor, and in the morning he will go to his own water closet. That's when he will rejoice. Even the man who you're 95 is shooting at us today. You see, these people are blinded. The leadership deceives them. We have a world historical mission to accomplish here. I see you want to say something, but I don't have time right now, and you're tired today. Go home and get some sleep. The days ahead will be even harder. We must be awake to be at our best. Once again, my thanks to your brave battalion. He extends his hand to me. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. General. As the car rushes towards the flower pot, I chew on the General's thoughts. I don't understand the words about culture. Has the General never heard of the wonderful Russian theatre, of Russian artists? Did he not see on the way to Stalingrad in every large village a well-equipped, newly built school with the most modern visual aids? Even in the poorest huts we found books. A large part of the young people speak German, and we ourselves know very little about Russia. And the lofty words about the future of the Reich and the meaning of the sacrifices made no longer resonate with me as much as they used to. I see where they have led us. And in the homeland, many have already grown distrustful of the leadership. The days of defeat make us all the more reflective. Me, anyway. Maybe someone else in my position wouldn't be able to take it all any more. But it doesn't make me feel any better. Since the night Rath's platoon blew up, I don't look at casualties so casually anymore. How many officers feel the same way? How will it end, Stalingrad and the whole war? My new dugout is ready. It is located in a narrow hollow that borders the flower pot from the north. Overhead are railroad ties, brushwood and a metre of earth. A boardwalk divides the dugout into two parts, a double door leads to a room for the adjutant, which accommodates, in addition, two soldiers. In the corner, a desk with folders, not yet filed orders, and a telephone. In the stove, one side of which heats the neighbouring room, the fire crackles from morning to evening. Through a narrow door you can get into my cell. It is square, with a table firmly embedded in the middle, and is quite habitable. There is a bedstead nailed to the wall. The ceiling is lined with yellow aircraft signal cloth. The walls of unplastered boards are covered with grey protective capes. Through a small window above, slanting rays of sunlight penetrate here during the day. In the long evenings and nights, the current is supplied by a battery, and a lamp covered with a colourful lampshade hangs over the table. The neighbouring dugout, which houses the headquarters, is also equipped in the same way, the companies are also located in safe shelters. They have long realised that here to winter, and energetically took up the cause, saving in advance everything that may be useful to them for the construction of dugouts. Especially when they were doing construction work in Razgulyaevka. Painted in protective colour, radio receiver brings music, reports the latest news from the front and from Germany. In Africa, things are bad. October 23rd, the 8th British Army went on the offensive at El Alamein. Field Marshal Rommel had to retreat. Tobruk is already in British hands. Reports follow one after another. The landing of the Americans and British in northwest Africa captured the ports of Casablanca, 
Oran, Algeria. The enemy completely seized Morocco and Algeria. From these official reports, our mood is not getting better. We are sullen, embittered, preoccupied with our own affairs, talking only about the most necessary and urgent and even then with great effort keeping calm. We are dissatisfied with ourselves and with everything that has been happening in the last few days. Now I have only one company, no matter how you turn it around, we call it a combat company, and it's commanded by Fiedler. By order from the top, disbanded all the offices and supplies and staffed this company to full strength, but it still cannot be called combat ready. Let's see how it turns out. Feldfabelov and non-commissioned officers are still enough, so maybe something will work out. The rest of the transport platoon, as before, is in the nursery. There, in the ruined houses and dugouts, is located repair and recovery service and financial and economic part. I myself am torn to pieces to satisfy all the requirements of the division and regiments with weak forces and insignificant means. During the day I go from Pontius to Pilot. I beg for twenty mines. I ask for four sappers to strengthen the assault group. Wherever I can, I put the brakes on the orders from above. In the evening I give the appropriate orders to Fiddler and the transport platoon, consult regimental commanders on sapper affairs, and prepare proposals for the division headquarters. And if there is time left, after midnight I check the platoons and groups that received the task. On the front line can move only at night, and therefore I have developed a peculiar routine. At 10am, rise, at 11, breakfast, at 15, lunch, at 21, dinner, at 4am, going to bed. It's a ridiculous life when night turns into day. In front of me, the order just received from the division headquarters, send all the horses to feed in the area west of Kalash. I call Berger. Here, read it. What do you say to that? Shall we send the horses to the rear? I'd do it, Mr. Captain. In winter, they're ballast anyway. It's hard to provide fodder. I agree. There's nothing for them to eat on this spit. But I'd keep a few riding horses, Mr. Captain. Why? You don't think I'm going riding or hunting, do you? Have you ever seen anyone riding here in Stalingrad? No, my dear. Let the horses go to the rear. Leave a couple of unaccounted for men to deliver mines and food. Everyone else to the rear. I, Mr. Captain, and when do I send them? The day after tomorrow. I'll draw up an order. Who should I assign? We don't have the officers for that. Assign Starfeldfuhrer Eckstein. His communications platoon has no work for the near future anyway. He deserves a little winter hibernation. And send Hauptfeld Feeble Seuss along with him. Someone has to do all the writing, and some groomsmen. But remember that here on the front line, we need every man. Berger is leaving. As soon as the door closed behind him, Paul Fiedler bursts in. His face is flushed, drops of sweat on his forehead, watery eyes glistening. Did you hear that? New sapper battalions are arriving. He blurts out. His words sound like a circus fanfare, in his voice, triumph and faith. What battalions? I really have no idea. They arrived yesterday. They're sending the strongest battalions from everywhere. In the Crimea, on the Don, in the north, they're loaded onto cars or airplanes and sent straight to us, to Stalingrad. They're already here, now it's going to work. I just heard from the infantry. I can't believe it. And yet it's true. Tomorrow is the first attack. I think, the tennis racket. And then Red October and all the rest, the leftovers. I wish it were like that. And with such speed. I remember the storming of shop number four. Understand, exclaims Fiddler. Five full battalions, sapper battalions. Yes, they will undermine everything around. It's only a shame that came at the end, when the resistance is almost broken. And now they can play the victors. Well, it's a long way off yet, but I want to see the attack. Just a minute, I'll find out. I'm on the phone with headquarters. Yes, indeed, it's just as Fiedler said. Five fresh battalions have arrived. Tomorrow at dawn they will clear the tennis racket, so we call the area between Red October and the centre of Stalingrad. The railroad arcs around this part of the city, 
and then rounds and goes in the opposite direction. On the map, it resembles the outline of a tennis racket, hence the name. Oil storage tanks and small businesses are located here. The terrain is crossed by ravines and gullies. You will have to overcome height differences. A thorough reconnaissance is necessary. But the Chief of Engineers of the Corps, who is in charge of the offensive, knows this better than anyone else. In any case, I intend to observe the progress of the offensive. Paul asks me to take him with me. Field Flabel Lentz will accompany us. It's pitch black. We get out of the car, we shiver from the cold, put our hands deep into the pockets of overcoats and walk to the front line. The night engulfs us. It envelops us and separates us from each other, creates islands, tears the whole into separate points. Shooting, and it is rare today, is limited to some patch. At times, the silence is just physically palpable and is complemented by darkness. Occasionally, single tracer shells fly up and immediately fade away, as if they are not comfortable today. The world today seems almost girlishly gentle. Even the fires in the city seem to burn less brightly and ominously today. But their flames are still strong enough to throw sheaves of hot fire into the night sky. Even the latest technology of our century somehow does not break this minor mood. Shots and bursts sound more deafening than usual. Searchlights with their grey-yellow long fingers fumble on the dome of the sky to prevent uninvited guests from approaching. The night, as if keeping some secret, looks at us with warm, mysterious eyes. We crawl into the trench of the advanced artillery observer. From this height we can see the whole offensive strip. It lies aslant in front of us. We can't distinguish anything yet. We are squatting on our knees, taking cover deeper to smoke in peace. We hear the clatter of soldiers' walks, horses neighing, and sometimes the squeak of wheels. Under the cover of night, the units take their initial positions. Companies and platoons are pulled up. Weapons and means of close combat are checked once again. From my own experience, I know what happens in these minutes. Suddenly the silence bursts. Gun salvos one after another, uninterrupted. From the black carpet behind us, short bursts of fire fly up to the sky. Hundreds of them. Shells burst on the slopes of heights and slopes of gullies, in ruins, on embankments. Everything shakes with a rumble. Waves of hot air roll over us. Dense smoke drifts over the ground. The first dawn rays break through it. They illuminate the deserted terrain blasted by shells and bombs. Salvo after salvo falls on the Russian positions. Whole garlands of shells are flying up. There shouldn't be anything alive there anymore. If things continue like this, the sappers will have no choice but to advance and occupy the territory. That seems to be the case. The heavy guns beat incessantly. Toward the first rays of the rising sun in the brightening sky carried bombers with black crosses, squadron after squadron. They dive and with a howl drop their bomb load on the target, and after them, new and new, dugouts and firing points are blown up, the enemy's defensive line is destroyed, oil tanks are burning. Yes, I wouldn't want to be there now. They're coming! Fiddler pushes me to the side, pointing down. I raise binoculars. Indeed, the firing shaft has already been moved deep into the enemy's defence. Our first groups are already approaching the front edge of the Russians, some twenty metres more, and they will already occupy the advanced Russian positions. And suddenly they lay down under hurricane fire. On the left, short bursts of machine guns beat. In the craters and on the firing points appear Russian infantry, which we had already considered destroyed. We see helmets of Russian soldiers. We can't believe our eyes. How, really, after this hurricane artillery fire, after the raid of dive bombers, which did not spare a single square metre of land and ploughed everything in front, there is still a live defence? Every moment we see how our advancing soldiers fall to the ground and no longer get up, how their rifles and machine guns fall out of their hands, but our units down there are still able-bodied, the gaps are immediately filled, and new soldiers, replacing the fallen, continue to go on the attack. No, the Russians cannot resist this superior force. 
The Russian line of defence has already been broken through here and there, in ever new places, cut to pieces. Separate wedge-shaped blows manage to capture metre by metre. The attack is breaking up into separate pockets. The threat of private encirclement forces to close the front of the offensive. Everything in motion and change, the pace and length of the offensive is growing. Railroad embankment complicates matters. But the flamethrowers and direct fire pierce the gap and here. The trembling enemy do not give a moment's respite. Here already the advanced groups have overcome the embankment. All efforts of the enemy are in vain, even where his defence is based on favourable terrain. The front line is falling apart, ours are moving forward. They've already passed halfway. I put down my binoculars and wipe the sweat from my forehead. It's hot and even hotter. The companies are moving forward as if on a formation, attacking as they were taught. They should be strong enough to get through here to the Volga. Then, by tonight, we'd have taken a good chunk of it. Now the units descended into the ravines to break enemy resistance there as well. The heavy guns have opened a barrage of fire from all their barrels to prevent the enemy from bringing up reserves. Infantry guns and mortars also beat. The offensive strip was almost empty. Folds of terrain have swallowed up the soldiers. Pillars of smoke rise from bursting explosives and burning tanks. The flames are already licking the edge of the ravine. Nothing else is visible. Everything is playing out as if behind the scenes. I am waiting for the units of our second echelon to appear, to reinforce the attackers and secure the captured territory. But behind, still no one. The wounded are being dragged to the rear. The medics are carrying stretchers. Why does not move at least that regiment on the section of which the offensive is taking place? The emptiness of the battlefield worries me. In the ravines, things seem to be going slowly. Judging by the sounds and smoke, our units are stuck. Machine guns and rifles are raging below. Now we see the Russians running forward through the barrage, running and disappearing into the folds of the terrain. It's reinforcements. The counter-attack we fear so much is about to begin. The noise of battle is already increasing. But there's no movement on our side behind us. Not one company, not one battalion, no reinforcements. Nervously, I light my cigarette. Fida looks down into the ravines and only curses gloomily. You're shitting yourself. We wait in incredible tension. After all, now must decide the outcome of the fight. Minutes, quarter of an hour, half an hour pass, the time seems like an eternity, and the invisible battle is still boiling below, but at last movement becomes visible. A soldier jumps over the edge of the beam. German. He's running back. Aha, uh -huh. probably a liaison with a message. But no, another, a third, a fourth. They're all running back. Behind them are some sappers. So, we're retreating. It's time to put the bulk of the battalions into action, but nothing like that is happening. Two or three minutes more, and the first helmets of Russian soldiers are already visible. The Russians are gradually accumulating, forming into groups, pursuing the haphazardly retreating sappers. Where are the rest of the forces of the five battalions? Are the retreating groups really all? Is that all that's left? The Russians are now approaching the original position. They open the same hurricane artillery fire on them as in the morning. The infantry regiment is beginning to move as well. The advance of the Russians ceases. Only in isolated places do attempts continue. The lines are consolidated, frozen. It's like before like before the attack, like yesterday, like a week ago. What's this obsession? Am I dreaming this whole battle? Five fresh battalions went on the offensive, five battalions felt like at home on the training ground. And the result? Most of them, killed, some wounded, the rest defeated, smashed to smithereens. It's an enchanted place. No matter how hard you try to take it, you run into granite. If they don't throw whole divisions here, we'll never reach our goal. Silent, depressed, gloomy, we set off in the direction of the flower pot. Fiddler mumbles something about Pyrrhus, about grandiose initial successes, about victories won at the cost of death. It's the same here in Russia, even in the smallest battle. 
My God, shut up at last. I'm tired. Doesn't he see? This is not the time or place to flaunt my education. I have other things on my mind. What's happening to me? Today I'm so worried about the loss of other men's battalions. Until now I thought that my sad thoughts were due to the fact that I knew the dead personally. And now? And then there's Fiedler and his high-minded speeches. What good are such apologetic comparisons to us? What's the use of these excursions into history? And what's going on here probably can't be compared to any other war or battle. Maybe the Battle of Verdun? But that was fought over fortified forts. This is fought over stairwells. Get the hell out of here with your clever speeches. They're useless here. What we've been taught isn't useful here. It won't help us. It's all a thing of the past. It's best to read about it in a field hospital when the nurse brings you a novel. Our relationship to each other is defined by something else entirely. Whether I can rely on the other, whether he is a decent guy, whether he will not leave me if I am wounded, that's what matters. When I sleep, I know my neighbour is there. When I attack, I know that he will bring a box of ammunition and remember to bring hand grenades. My life depends on it. Everything superfluous, everything that is not absolutely necessary at the front, we threw away. Only that which preserves and prolongs our lives is of value here. For example, instinct. It is it that tells you when to take cover. It is it that tells you to go this way and not the other. It prevails over reason. He who senses the storm in time is worth more than he who has a head full of wisdom. A razor-sharp mind is useless here. You don't need it to give orders, much less obey them. Pauses save us from insanity. How can we find a place in normal life with such qualities? We live only today, perceive only what is in front of us, swear, resonate, scold our general and Hitler, go to the CP to one and listen to the speeches of the other, because one is the division commander and the other is the supreme commander. I studied chemistry. Starting an experiment, I knew what should come out of it. And here? Here we throw everything into the flask and, of course, everything goes to hell. No one knows if the lab itself will blow up. I'm not going to give Fiedler a lecture, am I? He's as disappointed as I am, but I can't help myself from pulling him back to reality. But I'm trying to convince myself. I'm trying not to show it, but I can't help but feel it. Shut up about Pyrrhus and his victory, Paul. You keep those truisms to yourself. I'm hungry. That's more important. Let's pick up the pace. As you wish. I don't know how you didn't think about it. You just saw them trying. I did. I thought about it too. That's enough. I want to rest. Fiedler keeps muttering something. Then we walk in silence. My head hurts. Yeah, we fucked our heads against the wall today. It's a desperate situation. And we're in the middle of it. Soldiers and officers from the army and air force are crowding the flower pot. There are so many all-terrain vehicles, limousines and open cars that this godforsaken height has never seen. Cars of all colours, from blue to red and from black to white. Winter camouflage paint. On them are command flags of all calibres and colours. Next to the tiny flags of the commanders of regiments and battalions, black, white and red standards of the commanders of corps and divisions. Even the chief of the general staff of the Air Force, Colonel General Jashonik himself, arrived. These gentlemen don't seem to need caution. Such an accumulation is clearly unwis. One single airplane could do a lot of damage. A few artillery salvos, and this entire fleet of vehicles can be sent to the scrapyard and the servivores of the transport of dead and wounded. The higher generals are apparently unaware that the Russians also have observation posts from which they can see this lovely encounter. Most of the time artillery raids take place as soon as some god of war in a red or white overcoat manages to depart safely. Two days ago there was such a case. The commander of a neighbouring division arrived. He had no time to leave, an artillery attack. Four dead in the fighting company. I heard how the soldiers were indignant. It's a familiar story. As soon as they show up with their tinsel, we have dead men. The reason for today's visit is unclear to me. 
Paul assumes, they're making a newsreel. To find out what's going on, we sneak forward. An air captain explains to me what's going on. This is one of the officers accompanying Jess Chonek, who, together with Rich Toven, flew to the nursery this morning. You want to know what's going on here? A breakdown of today's offensive, nothing more. The Luftwaffe chief of staff was personally in charge of the dive bomber groups. Today was going to be a decisive day. We all believed in it. There was not a minute to lose. After all, nothing can be done here for a long time. Can't you tell me why? Because the main air force is being withdrawn. It's a dangerous situation in Africa. So what? Let them take them from somewhere else. We need every airplane here. That's true, but mind you, we're not very rich in aircraft. All the airplanes, down to old crates, are being thrown to the African front. You see, we took almost all the air transport units from Russia, not considering the strained situation. There was no other way out. And why, may I ask? To transfer new divisions to Africa. We're fighting now for Tunisia, to prevent the Americans and the British from going west through Algeria. We need every last airplane for that. What about the bombers and scouts we need? They'll take them all. They'll leave only the essentials here. They won't be of any use to you now anyway. There's not enough gasoline. Haven't you noticed there hasn't been a scout in the sky for a week? Yes, but what's the matter? All the gasoline transporters have been taken from here, and the railroad line from Lvov onwards is jammed with trains. For two weeks now, one hundred hundred freight cars have been stalled. But we can't sit here without aerial reconnaissance. There's nothing else for you to do, but we hope to bring you some fuel soon, because we don't like this whole story either, believe me. Corps commanders are always talking about the continued strengthening of the Russians, and we are currently unable to air reconnaissance means to establish this fact. The few available scouts can't provide the necessary data. No one knows exactly what's going on over there with the enemy. Yes, it's been a day of bad luck. Everything that had to see and hear today, as if on purpose, designed to finally throw off the mood. First a failed offensive, and now to be left without aviation. And what, in fact, is the basis for the press claims that the Russians are no longer capable of major operations? What is this, a bluff, a sedative pill? A few more days, and snow will fall, and the command is still wandering in the dark. Last winter must have taught him something. Then our troops stood near Moscow. Its fall was expected from day to day. The situation for the enemy was more than critical. And then a sharp turn, completely unexpected for both the general and the common soldier. Why? Because they underestimated the enemy thought that he no longer has the strength for a major operation. And what was the reality then? Rominger told me about it. Day and night rushed from east to west, Russian military echelons. All other railroad traffic was stopped, and the way is open only for them. It was said that a Red Army man sat on each steam locomotive and looked through binoculars so as not to lose sight of the tail of the train ahead. Our men laughed at this until the laughter stuck in their throats. Every day we notice here at the walls of Stalingrad that the resistance of the Russians is increasing, that more and more guns begin to talk from the other side of the Volga, that at night the enemy mines new areas, that there are more and more snipers. Should not this worry the command, cannot know about it, at the top? Operational air reconnaissance is now the Alpha and Omega, the basis of all tactical actions. And just at such a moment, no planes, no fuel. Yes, compared to our command, even the most desperate player in Monte Carlo, going all in, the most careful man who puts on the right card. Toward evening, I am called to the division commander. He is very serious and listens attentively to my words. Nods, agreeing, recognises, understands. Here he leaned over to the map of the situation lying in front of him with blue and red lines and tactical signs. Usually he tries to give the impression of a young, trim general, but today he looks ten years older. The harsh facts seem to have overwhelmed him. 
His voice is tired, muffled, his lips are dry, he speaks uncertainly. Now and then he grabs a glass of water. And it is not clear why he is like this, whether it is because the Russians pissed on him today, or because in addition the disgruntled bosses crucified him. But today he is anything but a general, at least not the kind I imagine a general to be. He is just a man in a general's uniform, which in itself obliges him to special actions and unperturbed calmness. He is just a wheel of the machine, just a transmitter of orders, not a commander who knows how to overcome difficulties and can show the way. And he is certainly not a bright mind. There are many things I would like to learn from him today. The answer is a shrug of the shoulders, indecision, unfounded promises. The only thing I get out of this conversation is this. The Corps Commander has approved your proposal about Shop Number 4. In the near future, preparations for the operation will intensify. Only the troops are missing. I'm glad I'm already out of the General's office. A fresh wind blows in my face. Suddenly a small Volkswagen stops next to me. Out of the car in the driver's overcoat in an old cap comes out a general with sharp features. This is Strecker, commander of the 11th Army Corps. For two and a half years he was my division commander. He is considered a typical Prussian, but he is not. He has no shorts and little official and impersonal coldness. The fact that we have begun to differentiate our chiefs means a lot in itself. It's a pity we didn't do it earlier. This became clear to me a few days ago. While in a dugout at the command post of the 305th Infantry Division, I witnessed a little conversation that would have made my professors at the military school pale. It was about Prussianism. The conversation was initiated by a captain in the reserve, by his civilian profession, correctly, a historian. This was evident from his extensive and very detailed knowledge of history. They talked about the emergence of Prussia, about its historical origins, about the robber knights and the Brandenburg brand with its miserable sandy soil, about the struggle of the Teutonic Order. The result was a state that has always been poor and hungry, but the people since the time of the first Prussian kings had been drummed into their heads that they were something special and unpretentiousness in life was the main virtue. And then this grey-haired man with the epaulettes of a captain pointed out the consequences of this development, the arrogance and insatiable greed of the Prussian rulers. He quoted Fontani, who at the end of the last century had called the Prussians a nation of sea robbers who made their pirata raids on land. Such a heated argument ensued as I have never seen in an officer's circle. Thank God there was not a single 200 percenter around, otherwise the conversation could have ended badly for its participants. In fact, at the end, all four officers agreed that this kind of Prussianism plays the role of godfather to us. Strecker recognised me. It's good to see you again. How are you? Thank you very much, Herr General. I have no complaints about my health. The rest is worse. We're having a very hard time here. I can imagine I'm not better either. The Russians in front of our front keep getting stronger in the big bend of the Don. We're not getting reinforcements. The air observers are to blame. They don't give me any information about the Russians. These types categorically state that the movement of transport behind enemy lines is insignificant. And with ground surveillance, even with the naked eye, you can see enemy troop concentrations. Is that the case with you? No, Mr. General. The confusion in the city doesn't allow us to determine the change in the balance of forces. We have to rely only on the testimony of the prisoners, and they haven't told us anything new so far. I wish I were wrong but I feel we're in for some difficult days ahead. Let's be prepared, however, that in a large bend of the Don in front of us is a lot of new Russian divisions. The pilots dispute that, but they just want to go to the south without interference, and they've been promised that if things are calm at the front, how's your battalion, your officers? Heavy casualties, Mr. General. The only officers I have with me are Fiedler, Franz and Berger. Firke is on vacation. Give my regards. Be glad you saved a few of our old men. The new officers are of little use. Stars and epaulettes alone don't make a man an officer.
They can't replace school, experience, and maturity. Well, I'm in a hurry. I wish you all the best. Be healthy, and be on your guard. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. General. We're going home slowly. How unlike each other these two generals are. One is faceless and helpless, with no opinion of his own and adrift, and the other seeing trouble coming. Preparing to meet it, acting. Whether he will be able to defend his opinion convincingly enough before Paulus, I don't know. Strecker correctly assessed the new officers, but this applies to soldiers and non-commissioned officers. A few days later, the first snow falls, and soon the whole area is covered with a white carpet. Sinkholes, ruins, ruins. All the wounds caused by the war and reminders of it are hidden from view by the white shroud. The broad plain, which has been a battlefield since August, becomes light and uniform. Here we attacked, day after day, again and again, Neither loud speeches nor newspaper articles helped us. Winter finds us in the same position as last year. Again there is no lull on the fronts. Again the objectives have not been achieved. Again there are no equipped winter positions. And won't it end the same way as last winter? When you stand in front of the dugout and look at the white dreary plain, involuntary goosebumps run down your back. Snowflakes are swirling, falling on your head and shoulders and it seems that they lay a heavy weight on you. My heart is clenched with heavy forebodings. My thoughts return to the last winter, to those many thousands of soldiers who were left lying that winter on the vast snowy fields of Russia and about whom it was reported that they were missing in action, although we all knew that many of them froze, and the one who survived received the Eastern Medal, which the soldiers nicknamed the Order of Frozen Meat. Maybe they invented a medal for us too. Some kind of order of the survivors? But how many survivors will there be this time?